The message of Jeremiah, once we get into it, I think you'll agree, it is good for today. It will be appropriate for what we're going through today. Essentially, Jeremiah is saying to the people of Jerusalem, Judah, quit arguing with God and just do what he says. Follow him. And I, I think if you're like me, we hear that from the Lord almost daily, if not <laughs> hourly. Quit arguing with me and just follow. Go where I lead. The first three verses of his book summarizes the entire book. So if you'll follow along, I'll attempt to pronounce these names correctly. Quote, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Forty years Jeremiah preached in Judah attempting by the power of God to get Israel to repent, to avoid going into exile. Well, Jeremiah just told us their response to his preaching. They ignored him. So they ended up being exiled into Babylon. That's a crying shame. Hopefully that's not us, although some of us have traveled a similar road. Perhaps the most often quoted verses in Jeremiah come from chapter 31, where God allows Jeremiah to be his prophet to tell Judah, there is coming a day where I will create a new covenant for the house of Jacob. A new covenant. As you know, that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the shedding of his blood. So from chapter 1 to chapter 31, we're going to see the prophecies, the preaching of Jeremiah for the purpose of getting repentance. So that when this new covenant comes to you, as it has already, we'll respond positively. This message is 2,600 years old, more or less. It hasn't changed. The same gospel message that was preached then is preached today. That life comes in faith in Jesus. It is to those who will repent. Because those who do not repent are hauled off into captivity in Jeremiah's day in the day of judgment coming later, they will suffer the second death, permanent death, the lake of fire. Therefore, his message true then, true today. If you look down at verse 1 again, it says, The words of Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah. If you look this word up in the Hebrew, you can see that this Hebrew word can just as accurately be translated the acts, A-C-T-S, of Jeremiah. And we're accustomed to that. The acts of the apostles in the New Testament. Many of you have studied that book. You've read through it several times probably. And you've come to realize that it's Yes, it's the acts of the apostles, but it's actually the words of the Holy Spirit through the apostles to establish the church. So you're accustomed to this dual meaning of words. So the words of Jeremiah are not just what he said, it's what he did. True then, true today. They then would have understood Jeremiah's actions Everything we're going to watch him do meant something. The words that he said, and oftentimes will have double meaning. 
We've seen this true when we study almost all the Bible. Verse 2, both them and us understand that these words are through Jeremiah, but they're actually the words of God. Verse 4, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, that is the declaration of a true prophet. The word of the Lord came to me and I repeated it. I told you what God told me to tell you. The entire Bible is the inspired truth of God. Authors were inspired to write down exactly what God said. Told them to write. Yes, it was written by man, but by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. It is truth. It is for our benefit. Verse 3. The word spoken up and until the Jews were exiled in Babylon. They didn't hear him. Oh, they understood. They, they listened. But they didn't hear. In a Hebrew sense, hear, O Israel, means to obey. All the parents in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. When a dad says, listen to your mom, he doesn't mean, go, go say to your mother, huh? What he means is go do what she said. Not about you. In my house, it meant don't make me get out of my chair. That's what here, listen to your mom meant when I said it. I am comfortable. I have my iced tea. I don't want to be bothered. Go obey her. Similarly, I think God is telling me, <laughs> Nolan, listen to what the Spirit's saying. Do you hear him? Yes, sir. I've been to the woodshed just often enough to understand what he's saying. Verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Typically in the Old Testament, the word nations refers to the Gentile people. So similarly, as Paul was ordained or commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles, preached the gospel to them, Jeremiah's words were to ripple out of Judah to the nations through those who would come to the temple to worship and it would ripple out into the nations. God wanted the Gentiles to be jealous of the wealth and prosperity, health of the Jews in Judah and want to know him, the God who provided all of this. Now I want to caution you. Just because Jeremiah was chosen in the womb to be a prophet doesn't mean that every prophet was chosen before birth. God is making a declaration about Jeremiah, through Jeremiah, about him. Now we know of one other prophet that was chosen before he was born, John the Baptist. But let's not generalize. Let's not say... Or allow somebody to say to us, you know, God chose me to come talk to you even before I was born. Right. You got proof of that? Uh, number two. Let's not assume that none of us were chosen before we were born for a specific task. Let's don't make that assumption either. It very well could be that you are a unique creation of God for a particular place, position, ministry in his kingdom, in his church. He has gifted you. He has provided you with talents, with salvation, probably, most likely, for a specific purpose. That's why Paul wrote the way he wrote about the church as a building living stones fitted together as a body knitly joined together where the eye can't say the foot, you know, I don't need you. Can't you just hear the foot say, okay, you don't need me, you're on your own. Roll around wherever you want to go. 
Nor can the eye say to the heart, you know, I don't need you. Okay, Mr. Blind Eye, get along without some blood. Neither can the church really survive without each other. That doesn't mean our church is going to shrivel up just because we lost Paul and many others in our church family. Because God replenishes the church just like he replenishes the body. But what I'm suggesting is, as long as we refuse to yield to the Spirit to do the task we know personally that God has called us to do, something isn't getting done like it could have be done because we're neglecting his call. That's what Jeremiah is trying to say. He was chosen before he was born for this task. I sanctified you. That means I set you apart. I declare that you will be ordained for this job. In the 21st century church, actually going back longer than that, churches have ordained ministers. They have a ceremony through which they ordain, sanctify, set apart a man for the duty of being the pastor, preacher, minister, whatever the title may be of that congregation, to do the work of a pastor outlined in Scripture. Some churches ordain their elders. They have a similar set of, a ceremony to set them apart, to declare they've been set apart for this duty. Jesus ordained each one of the apostles, commissioned them. Go read Matthew 9 and 10, and you'll see the ordination ceremony, not like we do it. He gave them the power to go do what he had asked them to do. There's many of us who would like to go read Matthew 10 and get that power. Wouldn't you love to have the power to heal diseases? Amen. You, we couldn't keep you out of the hospitals if you had that ability. How about to cast out demons? That'd be nice. That means you have to go to a different country. Wait a minute. Do we have demon-possessed people in the United States of America? Okay, you can stay home. What I'm trying to suggest is God has gifted you with an ability and a talent. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's something else to write, to teach. And while you're ignoring his call, you're ignoring the sanctification that he put on you, the ordination that he gave you to go do that. I ordained you a prophet. Sanctified, called, sanctified, ordained. Called, sanctified, ordained. In this way, we're going to see how the life of Jeremiah and the book, the chapters as they unfold, is going to correspond probably like most of our lives. Called, Gifted, you know, called, gifted, set apart to do a job. Warned, number two, go do this, follow me. Quit doing it your way and do it my way. You going to try that again? I thought we'd gone through this already. I don't know what your warnings sound like. That's what mine sound like. We reject, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be a missionary because you'll send me somewhere where I don't want to go. I don't want to talk to my neighbor because I don't like him anyway. I'm going to find a different way to get to Prescott than Highway 89. I'm going to do anything I can do to avoid the consternation that I, okay, I'll yield. So we fall. I don't know about you, but there's a period in my life when I was a young man that I just, I couldn't do it. Oh, I believe, I never didn't believe, but I just couldn't see it. So I did other things. I had other different jobs, ignoring what I think God wanted me to do from the first place. Sitting in a church in Fresno, California, a speaker came from a Bible college, and he spoke, and I'm listening to him and go, oh, his, his thing, his pitch for enrolling in the Bible college was, 
one year of Bible college is worth a lifetime of Sunday schools. And I thought, well, if I can just go one year and catch up to everybody else, this is a bargain. I was already enrolled in university in an ag major. No big deal. Five years of college, four years of college, no harm. So I go to San Jose, enroll into college. So I'm standing in front of the registrar, and she has the audacity to say to me, you know, we don't hide draft dodgers here. <laughs> what? This is during the Vietnam War. Well, I had a card in my pocket that says I'm, I'm ready to go. I already gave up my student deferment and went 1A. All they had to do is call me. I had cousins over there. So I said, sign me up. I'm not here to dodge. So what was supposed to be one year ended up being four. So what was supposed to be a bachelor's degree in agriculture so I could make lots and lots of money became a bachelor in theology where you make next to no money. I remember my first full-time job as a youth minister, 500 a month. Can you imagine living on 500 a month? Now let me set the stage. These are in the 60s, where gasoline didn't cost $3 a gallon. It cost 15 cents. So times were a little different back then. All of that to say this. Answered the call of God to go, got into it and thought, I don't know that I like this. I don't know that I like being poor all the time. I don't know that I, so I got out of the ministry and did other things for quite a while. And during that time, I had the opportunity to see what making money was all about. And I realized this is nothing. There's no joy. There's no happiness here. So we moved to Prescott, Chino Valley, started going to Calvary Chapel, and then God says, are you listening now? Do you hear me now? I said, okay. What I'm trying to say, your life is probably similar. Oh, the events in there are probably different, individual, unique, but similar. So as we're going through these chapters, these lines, when you see yourself, and if you're still in that rebellious stage, stop. You're just going to end up repenting, rescued. If you don't, you will stay in captivity. You will stay bound up in your way of doing things. Verse 6. Then I said, as if this doesn't sound familiar to you. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Moses, I can't go down there because I can't talk. Nolan, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Insert your own name and your own excuse. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. What do you sound like? The three-year-old you're trying to get to brush his teeth? Or an adult that God's saying, okay, let's go around the mountain one more time. I think that's why they were 40 years in the wilderness. If you ever watched a cowboy train a horse in a round pen, you know exactly what went on in the wilderness. The horse goes around the round pen again and again and again until the trainer sees yielding. Now a trained eye of a horse trainer knows when the horse is yielding and they allow the horse to stop running. And when the horse stops yielding again, they run. They run and they run and they run and they run. I think sometimes that the Israelites in the wilderness went around and around and around. We know why until that generation passed away that rebelled. Think about it. God told Moses, go to the promised land, pick out some spies, go in there and spy out the land, and I'm going to give it to you. 
The 12 go in, 10 come out and say, oh, no, we can't take that. Two say, God gave it to us, let's go take it. The other 10 go, no, they're too big, they're giants, we'll, we'll just die. So they took a vote, so to speak, 10 to 2. We're not going in. So God says, okay, you're not going in, you're not going in. Around and around and around. And if that's you, if you're tired of running in a circle, yield to God and let him give you rest and go do what he asks you to do. Trust me, it is a lot more intriguing, fascinating, energizing than running in a circle. Around and around and around. Seven. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I'm a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. Don't tell me how young you are. Just go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Go and tell. Just like the angels at the tomb, the empty tomb of Jesus when they ran in. Come see go tell. Jeremiah, hear what I say and tell them. Put your own name in there. Don't tell me you can't. Just go and tell them what I told you. Verse 8. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Now, in my version, the word LORD is in all caps. My preface tells me that means it's the word Yahweh, the name of God. Yahweh is saying to Jeremiah, just go and tell them what I tell you to tell them, and everything will be okay. Don't be afraid of their faces. Now, I don't know about you, I interpreted that as... Don't be afraid of confrontation. Look them in the eye when I talk to you. One of the things I hate the worst is being confronting. I don't like confrontational conversations. That's a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody I need to be stern with, I'll look anywhere but into their eyes. Unfortunately, my mother didn't have that <laughs> she looked me right into the face and told me what I did wrong and why she needed a switch. You see, God said, don't be afraid of their face. Don't be afraid of how they're going to look at you and talk to you and stare at you and deny you. You just go do what I told you to do. Just go and tell them. Verse 9. The hymn we sang fits perfectly with this. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The hymn we sang came from Isaiah when he touched his lips and made him clean. Go back and read that portion of Isaiah. An angel takes tongs and goes to the altar of God, takes a live coal with tongs from the altar of God and touches Isaiah's lips. Does he scream in pain? No. What did he say? <sighs> I'm clean. I was unclean, now I'm clean. Jeremiah just said, I can't talk, I'm too young. God says, I'll put for my hand, I'll touch your mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. We've seen similar phrases in the New Testament. Go and do, be afraid of what you're going to say. I'll give you the words. That was a promise Jesus gave to his apostles when they got arrested. Don't, bur don't worry about your defense. I'll give you the words. Unfortunately, some preachers took that as a promise. They didn't have to write a sermon. They could just stand up behind the box and start talking, and God the Spirit would give them a message. Now, but when you're on trial, when you have to defend the faith, don't worry about everything you're going to say. God give you the words as you go along. 
You know I'm telling you the truth. You've had this happen to you. I know that you have. You've been in a situation where somebody will come up and they'll ask a question and suddenly you're given an answer you didn't even know you knew. And you're walking away going, where did that come from? And suddenly you realize the Spirit of God just intervened and gave you the message to give them. Why? They needed to hear. Over the years that we've been in this building, not counting the years we've been in existence as a church, you've probably noticed how people come and go all the time. Have you noticed that? We'll have a family come in, maybe a couple come in, maybe an individual come in. They'll stay one Sunday or two and they're gone. Now there's two ways to take that. We can be hurt, well, I guess we offended another one. No! No, not at all. God needed them to hear, sense, feel his presence here that Sunday. Maybe it took two, maybe it took five. That's up to the Lord. But they needed that time for God to heal, sanctify, and send them either back to where they came or elsewhere. One Sunday morning, a couple came in and sat right there where Bruce is sitting, side by side. They listened to Dale sing and give his short testimony. They went immediately to him, visited with him, and never came back. Did Dale say something wrong? No. Dale gave them what they needed to hear. They didn't need to come back. You get my drift? You will meet somebody at Circle K, at the Safeway, at the drugstore, pumping gas. I don't know where you're going to meet them. And suddenly the conversation goes away. You never intend it, and they'll thank you or not and leave. And later you'll go, wow, that was a divine appointment. God just touched your mouth, gave you the words, and you encouraged. Trust that. Put forth his hand. I have given you my words. Verse 10. See, I have set this. Let me read it correctly. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, comma, to root out and pull down, comma, to destroy and to throw down, comma, to build and to plant. Do you see the power that God has just transferred to Jeremiah, his prophet? Look at those again. I have set you over nations and over kingdoms. Suddenly, it hit me. Jeremiah was being prepared for a spiritual war. The kingdoms that God was preparing Jeremiah has already armored you to fight is a spiritual battle with the kingdoms of the prince of this world who's fighting against our king and our savior who's setting up the kingdom of God on this planet. There is a spiritual war going on and suddenly I realized by the words of Jeremiah and Ephesians 6 where we're going to go to in a moment that we have been empowered to fight this war and he is being given all that he needs to do it to bring down the kingdom of Satan and build the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Israel which he thought he was doing but the kingdom of God. To root out and pull down. Every gardener in this room knows exactly what Jeremiah needs to do. He needs to go to those false prophets and those false teachers and those who are getting in the way of God's people and root them out. He needs to go to those false idols and pull them down. This is why you have been told by the Holy Word of God, be ready to give a defense for the hope that lies within you, to rightly divide the Word of God to study, to read, to pray, so that you are prepared 
to root out and pull down. And that's not the only thing. To destroy and throw down. Satan wants to destroy our families, our children, you. He is equipped, energized with the idea of taking you to hell with him. Now, I don't know what he knows. I suspect he knows what's written in the book of Revelation. I suspect he knows the lake of fire is waiting for him. But I think he is so arrogant and prideful, he doesn't care. Therefore, I think, I don't have a verse to prove it, that he wants to take as many of us with him as he possibly can. This is why he's attacking the church. He knows who he has wrapped up already. He knows all the false churches and the false religions out there in the world. He knows he's pretty much got those under control. So it doesn't take a whole lot of demonic activity to keep them all huddled up, to keep them agitated. But he's after you. This is why all this chaos is going on. This is why the church is being attacked the way it's being attacked. It is now being bound, banty, discussed, I don't know what the right word is, in our own U.S. Congress of passing a law that will make what we're doing today illegal. What? In our country? At our schools, our children are being taught heresy, anti-Christian stupidity. We talked about this Thursday night at the Bible study where John is writing to the church back then, that they need to be able to discern spirits. If you haven't for a while read 1 John chapter 4, go back and reread it. John is saying to the churches, be able to discern spirits. And he tells us how through chapter 4 and into chapter 5, how to do it. And one of the ways we do it is somebody who denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is a spirit of the Antichrist. We have that group in our town that denies that Jesus came in the flesh. We have another group in our town who wants to twist who Jesus is. So the Jesus they preach and call Jesus, call Lord, call Savior, really isn't if you go to their website and read what they're Doctrine says Jesus is all about. That kind of pressure is coming to our children every day. So the example I tried to give Thursday night was simply this. Your child, your grandchild is at the playground and they're talking about Jesus and the little kid, let's call him Johnny. So our church believes in Jesus too and your grandchild says, well, Jesus is the son of God. And little Johnny says, yeah, our church tells us that Jesus is the son of God too. Do you catch the subtle difference? Oh, Jesus is a son of God too. No, he is not a son of God, as in multiple. He is the son of God, as your child's being taught right next door. There is a huge difference between a and the. Now, I don't expect your six-year-old grandson or daughter to catch that, but when they repeat that to you around the dinner table or whatever, correct it. Now don't be mad at Johnny, because Johnny's being taught what he's being taught. But we don't believe that at our house, sweetheart. We believe that Jesus is the only begotten. I don't know what that word means. When you're older, I'll explain it to you. You see what I'm saying? It is so subtle, so deceptive, just like the serpent said to Eve, yeah, you're right, don't eat it because if you eat it, you become like him and he doesn't want you to be like him. Really? Is that enough time to get to Ephesians chapter 6? We'll get there now. Jesus did not come to overthrow the Roman government. Now, the Jews of his day had a difficult time with that. His own apostles had a tough time with that. 
So difficult was it in their line of thinking that the Messiah, when he came, would restore the kingdom of Israel. They asked him, are you ready for this? After he was crucified, after he rose from the grave on the third day, like the prophets predicted, and after he had been alive for 40 days, they said to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They just couldn't get it in their head, the kingdom that he came to establish. You do, thank God you do. That his kingdom is not of this world. It is the kingdom which you're about, busy about establishing with his help, his power. Jesus came to destroy the kingdom of Satan by building the kingdom of the church. Build the kingdom of the church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I interpret that verse in Matthew as being this. When the church is empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, the gates of hell that's holding all the captives of Satan will not stand up to you. The gates of hell will not prevail. I don't see it the other way around. I don't see that the church being a sanctuary and the, the demon, demons of hell can't prevail against you. No, that's upside down, that's backwards. The gates of hell won't, cannot stand up to your power, your ability, your ministry, your challenge to go do. Therefore, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, period, against kingdoms. That's why I went from Jeremiah to Ephesians 6. God has empowered you to go against the kingdom of the devil, the principalities of demonic powers, and defeat them. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand, stand, withstand, in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Not run away, stand on the rock who is Jesus, firm in your faith, and withstand all the wiles that he is throwing at you daily, time and time again. 17. I jumped ahead too far. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, verse 14. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked men. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. May I suggest that Paul is talking about you praying for each other for this kind of boldness that you can withstand the evil one. I suspect, if not this past week, the week before, no later than that, you have sensed the power of the devil come against you. 
you wanted to do something, you wanted to have clarity in something, and Satan prevented it. So I'm suggesting you do what Paul has told the church to do. Put on all the armor of God. Now notice, not one piece of this armor is available at any store. It's all spiritual. Notice another thing. When a soldier puts on his or her uniform, that uniform does not make him or her a soldier. You follow that line of thinking? They were a soldier before the uniform. When you put on the armor of God, you don't become a soldier for Christ. You already are one. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy all about. You're a soldier of Christ. You're already in the fight. You're not going toward it. So put on all the available armor. The righteousness which Christ has given you, stand firmly in it. The salvation that he has protected your mind with, use it. The shield that he's given you to thwart his fiery darts, use it. The gospel that he's equipped your feet to take to other people, Go, make disciples, and preach and teach what he's commanded us to do. We've already won the victory. we just got to go take it. We've already won. We just have to go take it. Therefore, I conclude with this. Fight the good fight. You're in it. You might as well fight it. Accept the commission God has given you. Quit fighting against that. Take up the armor. Go back and read Ephesians 6. Go back and read 1 John chapter 4 or the entire little letter. It'll all do you good. And realize you're in a war that he thinks he's going to win over you. And I'm here to tell you, absolutely not. Fight, if not for your own sake, for our kids' sake. Amen?